Thank you so much, Mala. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone at JetBrains, and thanks, everyone, for joining. It's great pleasure to have you all here today. I want to talk about records, but like Mala said, uh, do ask questions, post your comments along the way, and, and if there are uh, you know questions that need to be answered right away, Mala would be so kind enough to jump in and ask the questions, and I will respond to them uh, as we go along. So we're not going to take the questions in the end, so please do ask questions anytime you have it, and we'll, we'll take care of uh, answering your questions or addressing your comments. I want to talk about records. Records are an interesting feature in Java, but I want to get into a little bit depth here today as well and talk about a few nuances. As I was getting deeper into records, there are a few surprising things I came across, and I want to really talk about those today. And along the way, of course, understand the benefits of records, how we can make use of that as programmers as well. So let's get started. I'm going to do quite a bit of live coding here with examples. That's where the shakiness is going to come in as I start typing on the monitor. So please bear with me as, as you see the code. Keep your eyes on the code. It becomes easier to watch it than on me. And of course, uh, you know, we'll look at some interesting concepts in the records and how we can make use of them as well. But what are records? In a lot of different languages, we call records as data classes. That's what they are called as. So records really are classes that are focused on really data. So typically, in object-oriented programming, we create abstractions. When we create abstractions, we focus on behavior, which is really a good thing to do. We want to focus more on behavior. There's no doubt about it. But irrespective of how well we do that, we really need to still deal with data. So the question is, how do we model the data? Well, we typically model data using classes as well. What if we can separate that out and clearly demark it as this is a data object? Well, that is exactly what records provide us, is an ability for us to define data. But of course, when we define data, there are certain things we really want to focus on not as much behavior, but more of data manipulation and processing. Well, keep in mind, records are not done yet. Records are improving as we speak. There are some interesting features that's coming up in the next few versions of Java as well. But here I'll talk about what we can already do with records in current versions of Java. So let's talk about one of the very first things we can do is we can go from a verbose syntax to something really nice and short. Oh, by the way, if later on you want to take a look at these code, please don't hesitate to download them from my website. You can take a photo of that URL right now, and that way you can look it up later on. Don't rush to look at it right now, but it'll be there. You can take a look at it later on. So let's talk about the verbose syntax to something that can be really sweet and nice. Let's start with a little example right here. So let's say we want to create um, uh, you know, a little example of an instance we'll start with. So notice we have a little address as a location and I want to go ahead and print out that particular location right here. So the question is, how do we create the location here? Well, traditionally, we would create a class called the location, as you know. And within this, of course, we would start writing a private, if you will. We can say final. I don't want to really modify this location. So I put the word final, which really is an interesting aspect because in Java, at least in the past Java, the defaults were not very safe. I like the final to be the default. That was not the case in the case of Java in the past. So here we're going to say a private double latitude, let's say, so latitude. And we will also create here one more thing. Let's call this as a longitude as well. So there are two different fields we created. But are we done yet? Well, the answer is far from that. You'll create a location, and within this, you will say double lat, maybe, a double lawn, maybe. And then, of course, we will go about initializing these, these fields. So we'll say latitude equal to lat, and maybe longitude is equal to lawn. And are we done yet? Well, not really. We would create a public, maybe a double get latitude. And in this case, of course, we will say 
return latitude on this one to return it. And similarly, we would create a double maybe get longitude as well. And in this case, of course, we will return the longitude value. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, oh, come on, Venkat, that's not fair. We're not going to be writing all of these things. We would simply define that field and gently right click on it. And before we could blink our eyes, it would vomit the rest of the code. Well, unfortunately, if it vomits the rest of the code, we got to live with that vomit forever, isn't it? Sure, we can use really fancy IDs. And one of my favorite IDs, of course, is IntelliJ IDEA, even though I'm not using that right now in this case. But you can use those good IDs, but I don't want IDs to fill in the deficiencies to the languages. I want the languages to be mature, and I want IDs to take us even further to improve our productivity. So in this particular case, we wrote all of that code and maybe a little bit more. But then if you really look at the output, that was really not very useful, isn't it? Unfortunately, though, that is one of the problems here is that the language is not really helping us to write mature code. Well, that was the past. We don't have to endure that anymore. We can simply come down here and say, record is a record here rather than a class. And we can say record location. And we can now start removing code rather than adding code right there. So notice we are getting down to the most basics of things, which is really the point I want to make really here is you don't have to rely on an IDE to really get your work done, but an IDE can take you a lot further than this and, and make you more productive by doing things you would otherwise will do, but make you productive. But these are things you shouldn't be doing and the language should take care of it, not an ID or a third party library. That is really the point in here. So having written this right now, when you run the code, even the output is a lot better, as you can see. So we went from a verbose piece of code to something really concise and nice and short. That's basically what we gained right there. But there are some bonus functions you also can benefit from right away. You saw one already. So you have the two string method that you got. But can you imagine this? Records give you buy one, get five free offer. Isn't that really cool to get five things free if you will? So essentially, in this particular case, what you're dealing with here is the, the, the compiler is giving you all these functions together, meaning a constructor is given for you already. Similarly, all the getters are given to you. A equals method is given. And similarly, a hash code method as a companion to it is given. And a two string method is given. We already saw the two string method being used right there. But similarly, you can call latitude as a function. That's your getter right there. But you can also say, for example, let's say here is a location. We'll call this as location one. And let's create a location two as well. But this is going to be a different value. Let's go ahead and say. So in this particular case, let's go ahead and say a 142. If I were to output right here, let's say this is dot equals. And if I were to say location one, like so, you will notice the output is a true. On the other hand, if I ask for a location two, the output is actually a false, as you can see right there. Well, that's the equals method working for you behind the scene. So you have these five things created for you automatically when a record is initialized are created by the compiler. So essentially, the whole idea of this is that you need to write only minimum code to express your ideas. And the compiler does things for you automatically so you don't have to waste your time and effort. But this is where I'm getting, getting excited about the safe defaults. Uh, records are immutable as they are created. So when you go back to this particular example of the record we just created right here, you are able to output the latitude, as you can see right there. It says 37 is the value. However, 
if you try to say a latitude is equal to you know some value you want to change it that doesn't work you can also not pass that as a data like it were a function and to try to change it you cannot do that as well that is because the latitude and the longitude are final automatically. So as a result, this becomes really easy and interesting to express your desire to have a data object, but you don't really need to be worrying about making them final because they are final. Well, final, of course, is you know effective. Java mentioned why we should use finals. Final is less error prone. It's also easier to parallelize the code. It is easier to debug the code. It's easier to reason and maintain the code. There are so many benefits to making this final, while well, records favor final by default. And, and that's the way it stays. But you have to be, of course, a bit careful. You shouldn't really uh, focus on uh, working on immutability and take it for granted. Pay attention to what immutability means in this context. The references are immutable. So I'm going to give you a bad example here that you should avoid doing in general. So I'm going to say string builder. And I'm going to say this is a name of a location. I'm going to put a bad idea here. Don't do this. And, and why is that? We'll see in just a minute. So I'm going to say new string builder. And I'm going to say the rock like so. Well, that's great so far. We created a, a rock as the name. But why is this a bad idea? The reason it's a bad idea is you can go back here to this code and you can potentially do the following. You could say dot, let's say name, dot append. I'm going to say oops over here. And as you can see, the name has been modified. So you don't want to really rely on that. So it's your responsibility. So what's the model of the story? Make sure the components, as they call it, I call it members sometimes, are are really, uh, I would say, self immutable. So you want to make sure that what you pass in is truly immutable. For example, a string is a good choice, and I'm going to call this as a good idea. And of course, in this case, you made it a string. So this would become just a string right there as well. And as a result, you obviously cannot call append on it. You cannot modify the string. So as a result, it is safe to say it is immutable. And that is basically what you are looking at right in there as well. So some of that is some of the benefits that you see. Oh, yes, please. Um, so I so the, the two questions which I wanted to ask, one is the obvious one. I think you would have got it multiple times before as well. It's about the comparison of uh, uh, records and Lombok. Why not use that and use uh, records? Yeah, and, and this is the same argument about an IDE and a library. So there are, if you rely on an IDE, the problem is not everybody uses the same IDE and maybe not the same version of an IDE. With the library like Lombok, the problem is you are again giving to a library what a language should be doing. Now, if a library is discontinued, if a library is not maintained, if a library is not updated to a newer version of Java, it can hold you back in terms of evolution. And there are other complications that come with the library as well. And uh, on the other hand, when a feature becomes a feature of a language, it works cohesively with a lot of other features. And as the language keeps improving, records are not in isolation, for example. Records interplay with uh, pattern matching. L records interplay with other uh, concepts and ideas. And now, you, it becomes a hack, isn't it? Because for every feature you want, and you want to mix it with other features, are we going to depend on libraries to support it? And not everybody uses the same libraries as well. So what should be a language feature should be a language feature not delegated to a library or to a IDE. And, and, and that is where the central difference comes in, is where it belongs. Absolutely makes sense. The other uh, popular question is why is it moving away from the Java B naming convention of get component name and having the uh, just the uh, component name? 
Java Bean Convention is bogus. Let me put it in simple way, simple terms, because the Java Bean Convention really did not deliver on what it was intended for. The intention of Java Bean was that you have properties and the properties can be discovered in a, in a dynamic manner. But that concept never, unfortunately, took root. And all we are doing with Java Bean Convention is uh, adding ceremony of these getters and setters that make it uh, horrible in terms of more boilerplate code that we have to write and maintain. So there is no reason to pretend that something that didn't really work is a good idea to maintain. So, so that is one of the central themes here is that we don't really care about that convention as much because when it was created 28 years ago, there was a different intention. Well, as time moves on, we need to really move forward with what really works really well and maybe let go of things that didn't really work out, even though that were created originally with good intention. Thank you so much. I'll move forward with, uh, let you move forward with your session. Great questions. Thank, thanks for those uh, asking those questions as well. I love it. Uh, so let's let's talk about a few more things in here. So we talked about the immutability and the caution with immutability. But as you can see, the final is the default. The way it actually behaves is the way it actually works. I'm going to get rid of that to simplify our our uh, example here for a few minutes. So so in this case, we can we can see that the final, the fields, the components, the members are final by by the way are they are defined. In a similar way, the records are final as well. So for example, if I say class, a special location extends from, let's say, location. So I cannot do this. So if I were to try to do this, notice the error that you get Constructor location in record location not given, that's great. But notice in the extents, cannot inherit from the final location. Look at the very top line. So what that really means is that without you saying records are automatically a final class. So that is the beauty of it. Records are final. You cannot inherit from them. You cannot extend them. Not only that, you cannot extend a record from anything. So if you were to go back and say extends even object, for example, you will get an error. And, and the error doesn't tell you what the problem is. It's just curly expected. But what it's really saying is you're not supposed to extend your record from anything because records already extend from a Java lang record. So, so a java.lang.record, you could say, record is already the base and and you cannot even say extends java lang record you cannot extend period they already extended for you and you are required to just simply use that so so that is basically another restriction but i call these as restrictions for the good i love these restrictions but you can implement interfaces if you really want to. For example, if I were to say, uh, let's say, for example, I have an interface called, let's call it as to JSON as an example, and I could say, for example, string, uh, let's say generate, uh, we'll say generate a JSON right there. Maybe in my application, I will look for various places to generate JSON with and treat it as a common interface. So I can come down here, for instance, and I could simply say uh, the object dot generate a JSON maybe. So what I can do here is I can say implements as you would normally do uh, to JSON like so. And in this particular case, you can simply ask it to provide the implementation uh, right now. Uh, it, just to emphasize this, when you try to compile the code, it is complaining interface enum record expected in line number three or oh, interface. Yeah, that's a fate. Uh, it, let's change it as interface. So notice in this particular case, it tells you that you need to override the to JSON function. So just a normal way of inheriting uh, implementing interfaces works here as well. So if I say generate JSON like so, and of course, I can say return 
and I can use a text block and we can say formatted. And maybe in this particular case, let's go ahead and say a latitude and longitude as well. And within this, I could simply write a JSON implementation. So we could say, for example, a latitude and we could simply say, here comes the value and maybe a longitude and maybe here comes the value as well. And we can have that generate a lat and long value very easily as a JSON uh, you know, data, if you will. And you can work through the syntax for that as well as you may please. So that is another example of how you can implement interfaces if you wanted to uh, very easily in this particular case. So life becomes a lot easier for us to work with as well. Well, so far so good. These are some basic, you know, natures of records, but there are some complications that we need to really understand as well. When it comes to complications, we need to be aware of not only the ways to make use of something, we should also be aware of ways in which we shouldn't do certain things. But also things can be a little confusing if we are not careful about how we implement certain things. We can fall into a trap on, on doing things. And of course, you know, be careful, right? We should never say never is a saying. There are times when we may do things that are not really great, but there are reasons for doing it and then we refactor to something better. This is another place where I truly believe IDs can be really helpful. So if you have a traditional class and an ID can help you to convert that into a record, for example, and promote good practices, or if you're going to be hand tailoring it and refactoring, there are certain things you want to keep in mind. So for the for about next 10 minutes or so, let's focus on constructors, but more so the do's and don'ts. And I also want to clarify how certain things behave so we can understand rather than being confused about, my gosh, I don't understand. This seems like a magic. We need to have a better understanding of how things actually work together. Well, the very first thing is, don't bother writing a constructor if you don't need to write one. So notice in this example, we are using a constructor. The latitude and the longitude was passed in as the constructor parameters like here, like we normally use that to create an object that doesn't look any different whatsoever. However, Notice we did not write a constructor. And that is because a constructor was written for us automatically. So in this particular case, when you create a record, the good news is a constructor was created for us automatically. So that is the good news. You don't need to do any work. So why would you bother writing any code that is not needed? Well, you may say, gosh, I'm a consultant and I get paid by the number of lines of code I write. Well, I give you that. Then you need to really write it. But in that case, you can simply write comments and get billed for it, right? You're just kidding. But don't write any code that is not required. There is no reason to be writing such code. And so if you don't need to write a constructor, don't bother writing it. So what you wrote is good enough. Be happy with it. However, you may be tempted to write a canonical constructor. So what's a canonical constructor? A canonical constructor is the constructor you would normally expect. In this example, it's a constructor that will allow you to initialize a location with a latitude and a longitude. Why would you typically write a constructor? You write a constructor to initialize data, remove that, that's done for you already, no need to write one. But in addition to it, you write constructors to validate. You want to make sure that data is in a certain state. And if it is not an acceptable data, you want to reject it. So that is one reason why you would write, use a constructor. Another reason you would typically write a constructor is you want to transform some data. Maybe a user is going to give us a data in one form. You want to transform it to something else, potentially. You may want to cleanse data sometimes. You may want to align the data to a certain value or a certain range. 
whatever those reasons could be, you might be tempted to write a constructor. My first recommendation is, we'll come to the recommendation in just a minute, but let's talk about a canonical constructor, how we would write it. Let's put a little example here. I want to validate that the range of latitude and the range of longitude is correct. In addition to it, maybe for whatever reason, the business tells us that the latitude should be only two decimal places long. Notice this latitude is three decimal places, but the latitude should be only two decimal places. They want to restrict it as well. How would we write the constructor for that? So we could say over here, location is the constructor, double latitude and double longitude as well in this case, for example. So you specify those two right in there. Then you can say this dot latitude is equal to math dot, let's say round, and we can say latitude times 100, and we can divide by 100. So this brings us to a two decimal places. And you could also specify this dot longitude is equal to the given longitude. So this is typically a way you would write a constructor. That's your canonical constructor as well. So essentially, in this case, uh, what you are doing is uh, receiving those data cleansing the data, transforming the data, and then just putting it back into the latitude variable. But on the other hand, you could also say if latitude is less than minus 90, or in this particular case, well, it's a latitude basically. So you can say, or the latitude is greater than 90, or you could say the longitude is less than minus 180, or the longitude is, we could say, for example, uh, you know, greater than 180. You could simply maybe check for that condition and say, oh, what do we want to do here? We could say throw new runtime, let's say, uh, exception in this case. And what do we want to say for the exception? Well, we'll simply say out of this world, right? So essentially, we can perform some validations if you like. So if I go back to this code and say new location, oh, let's say a 200.37, and, and let's say minus 122.423, uh, and you run the code, what you will notice here is, notice the latitude is two decimal places for the first object. And the second instance we created blew up with an example in this case, uh, with an exception rather in this case, with the out of this world. So that is an example of error checking we did. Having said this, my recommendation is, please don't do this. And why should we not do this? This is not preferred. So, so when would we ever do this, right? Remember, never say never. When would you do this? The time you would do this is if you already have a class in your legacy code and you want to convert the class into a record. So as a very first step, which is perfectly fine, as a very first step, you could go take your class and you can change that into a record. That could be a very first step. Then you could start converting incrementally your class to a record. In that interim phase of conversion, it is OK to do this. So except uh, temporarily when you could say when you are refactoring, you could say refactoring a old and old class in this particular case, refactoring an old class to a record. So again, that's never say never, right? So don't do this uh, unless if you are refactoring from an old code to a newer record. So a temporary solution is OK. So but why not? Why shouldn't we do this? That's a very important question to ask. The reason really is these two last lines. Notice you are updating the latitude and updating the longitude. Now, if you run the code, you can see it worked. It ran. If you remove this last line, it won't compile. Notice it says variable longitude might not have been 
initialized. So it's complaining. You're not initializing longitude. Well, every component, every field has to be initialized. That's not dry. That's duplicated effort, isn't it? It can be error prone as well. Why bother with that? Minimally, you want to focus on conveying your ideas. That's a much better way to do rather than having to really focus on simply writing everything like we used to do. So what is a better alternative? This is where this concept, if you will, of the com compact constructor comes in. So what's a compact constructor? As the name alludes to, a compact constructor is compact. It's concise. It's really succinct in terms of how you can write it. So in this case, you can remove this part right there, as you can see. So public location curly braces. Hey, what are the parameters the location is going to take? Well, that's given in the constructor already. And where is it? Right there in the top. So you don't have to redo the whole thing. You have specified what your constructor parameters are. So your location is going to take latitude and longitude. That said already, why bother repeating it number of times? But then you come back and perform your validations and transformations. So what about a validation? What you are saying is, my latitude and longitude must be in a range. If not, I'm going to throw an exception. Great. Let's just start with that alone for a minute and run the code. And you can see the exception in the bottom. So that tells you this kicked in. But what about the land latitude? Notice the three decimal places. You want to transform to two decimal places. What are you going to do? You first get rid of the longitude. You're not touching it. But what about the latitude? You're not going to say this dot. You're going to simply say latitude equal to, and you're going to set the value. Now, this is the part that may be a bit confusing, but it's important for us to understand what we are actually doing. So for this, let me get rid of the exception here so it's a little easier to see the output. So when you run the code, notice the latitude is two decimal, not three decimal places. If you were to say uh, uh, this dot over here, look carefully at the error that you are getting. It says cannot assign a value to final variable latitude. And this may confuse you to say, I don't understand it. Why is latitude final, it says? Because as we know, in constructors, we can set final values. Aha. So that is the first thing you want to keep in mind. The compact constructor is really not a constructor. So that is the very first revelation we need to really understand. So the compact constructor is not a constructor. Whoa, then what is it? So I want to pause here for a minute and understand what's really going on. So this one is a very nice, concise way for us to transform the data and to perform validation. But the way this works is the following. Notice we are calling the constructor right there. So in this case, you have the call to the constructor, right? So this is what you have on your side. And from here on, we'll simply call, say call. And from the call, you're going to go all the way to the constructor that you are calling, which is typically what you do. So if you wrote a canonical constructor, you're going to call the canonical constructor right there. So this is the canonical, right? Canonical. Uh, constructor, you, you know, whether you wrote it, uh, you know, or they, uh, you could say, did. And as we talked about, it is better that you rely on what they do. You don't want to write it. So, so they created it is better than you writing it. But irrespective of who wrote it, you have a canonical constructor. But what you have now is right in between those two, right here in the middle comes your 
canonical, cons uh, sorry, compact constructor. So this is the compact constructor that is sitting right in the middle. And like I said, the compact constructor is really not a constructor in the sense of a constructor. So what is the purpose of a compact constructor, you may ask? So here's a way to think about a compact constructor. Think of it as a transformer or a map function. That's what it really is. It's a transformer or a map function. So essentially what a compact constructor does is you are receiving the data from the call. So in this particular example, you are calling this particular constructor right there. So when you do that new location, it is taking these two values and it's feeding those into the compact constructor. What does the compact constructor do? Compact constructor results in data that is going to be returned back. Here is the strangest thing. When you look at this, this latitude here is not this latitude. It really is a transformed data that is going through here. So you are receiving a latitude and you are returning a latitude. So in this particular example, think of the compact constructor as receives uh, you know, components, uh, in this particular case, the uh, components, which is the latitude and longitude, and returns uh, it transformed uh, components. So ba basically, if you do transform it, it's going to return it. So that is the mapper or the transformation in between. So if you look at the code with this understanding, look at the code again and see if this begins to make sense now. So here is your compact constructor, which is the preferred thing to write. And what does the compact constructor say? Well, you made the call with the data for us. And, and here comes the data that we saw, 37.8727 and 122.423 negative. And it says, is the lat and the launch in the right range? If not, throw an exception. Hey, that was okay. What do we do now? Then you say, hey, I'm going to transform the given latitude to a newer value, but I'm going to leave the lat longitude the same exact value. So the net result of this particular call right now is the following. You took the latitude and you transformed it so transformed it, and here is the newer latitude, <laughs> pardon me, and here's the newer latitude. You took the longitude value, and you didn't do any transformation, and you simply passed it on. So that is the mapping that you really went through here. So essentially, the purpose of a compact constructor is to act as a transformer. So think about it as a transformer. Your data comes in from the constructor, and you're sending the transform data on the other side, and you're pushing it through. That's basically what you're doing. So hopefully, that gives you an idea how that actually works. So the as I, I sense over here is, which one should you prefer? My recommendation is you should almost always prefer a compact constructor. So this is what you should be writing almost all the time. The only time, a little window of time, when I would say a canonical constructor is accepted is when you're refactoring code manually. If you're using an idea to refactor, then you don't have to worry about it. They're going to take care of a good job for you. But if you're manually refactoring it, then you need to make sure that you have the compact constructor temporarily, pardon me, you have a canonical constructor temporarily, and then swiftly move towards replacing it with a, a compact constructor. What's really nice about a compact constructor is you cannot modify that this, you cannot modify the parameter, which are a component of an object because it's immutable. And the reason you cannot change it is it's not really a constructor in the sense of a constructor. 
one last thing about constructors. We saw all this beautiful example of how this works. And I hope this example was helpful to understand how a compact constructor actually works. And, and we saw that it's actually a transformer. That's what it really is, where it transforms or maps the data over for you. However, having said that, there are times when you might really want to make use of a non-canonical constructor. So what does a non-canonical constructor actually do for you? Non-canonical constructors are constructors that don't conform to the, uh, you know, the standard constructor or the most expected constructor for initializing the components or the fields, if you will. So what are we going to do in this particular case? I'm going to do one little thing here uh, just for our purpose. I'm going to say called so we can actually look at it. And you can see that it says called before the constructor is initialized, it's going to call it. We'll, we'll leave that for now. We'll come back to it. So now I say public location string, let's say location. That's a non-canonical constructor. It's perfectly OK for you to use a non-canonical constructor. There is nothing wrong with it. There are times you want to provide ease, time you want to provide convenience. You want to be able to do that. So in this particular case, I can say this parentheses, and I can say this is going to be a double dot, a double, let's say dot, a parse double. And this is going to be taking in our location dot, let's say, split. And I'm going to split this on, oh, what's the value I'm going to split on a colon, let's say. And, and once I split it on the colon, let's go ahead and say I want to then take the first value out of it. So that is my very first double value that I'm bringing in, comma. And let's go ahead and say in here is a double dot parse double. And I'm going to say this is on the second one. I'm going to be uh, transforming the data as well. And let's go ahead and close that up right there. Assuming I didn't make any mistakes doing that, we can see how this is going to work. So we can go back here and say uh, output, let's say, new location. But this time, I'm going to say, well, as a string, let's go ahead and say 34, uh, let's say uh, 34 dot you know, 32 comma minus 121 dot 47 or whatever the value that I want to provide in there. But as a string, and we can run that code, and, and what does it tell us? Oh, let's see, number exception format right there, uh, just a little brute force code right here. And uh, in this case, we want to take the data and transform it. So parse double, and we want to transform the zero. We want to transform this particular one data along the way as well. And let's see if that is actually a good data. Let's see where I'm making the mistake in this case. Number format exception uh, for input string. Uh, I need to make sure it's split is happening properly. Of course, a colon isn't it. I'm forgetting what I'm doing. So when I run the code, you can see that's uh, working also. But did you also notice that your non-canonical constructor is actually calling your canonical constructor, but it's going through your transformer at this point. So just to emphasize this, you can say, here is your constructor call, and it goes through a, your compact constructor, and then it goes through your canonical, you can say canonical constructor, right? So that's what it does. Similarly, you could say in this particular case, so constructor call, we'll just abbreviate it for a minute, and then you have a non-canonical constructor, right? Canonical uh, constructor. And when you call it, what happens? So your non-canonical constructor is going to also send you a request through the compact constructor and to the canonical constructor after that. So that becomes a sequence. So all the error checking still is valid and is being done for you already. So that is the transformer again and how we are able to make use of it. So hopefully that gives you an idea how these things can be really used. And, and that's a little bit of a confusion that I've seen around the way constructors work. But hopefully, this demystifies some of these concepts, and you understand how this concept actually works. And essentially, you are able to 
perform this transformation of data rather than uh, you know mutation of data. So the data you're changing is not part of the object. It's just a transformation through it. That's what you're really doing. Now, I want to spend one last thing in here uh, talking about how the records can be used in one other context. Uh, question or comment, Mala, but delighted to. Um, if you are, if you want to cover that topic, I'm good to take the questions later. But if you are good to answer questions now, I could ask them now. Now was a good time. Now was a good time. Okay. Okay. So uh, a lot of uh, concerns, questions about since uh, records do not have a no arguments constructor, which a lot of frameworks do. So a lot of folks are asking, what are the workarounds? Uh, let's say there was one question about uh, working with ORMs. So the ORM classes, they need records in um, Hibernate and Spring as well. So they're asking your opinion if they want to use records, how should they work with uh, libraries and framework which require no argument constructors? So that's going to be a little bit bumpy, right, if they insist on a no argument constructor. Some of those uh, you know, libraries may have to evolve to support records in a more cohesive way. That's one answer. Yeah. But a different answer, this kind of ties it back to the question, why do we want a no argument constructor? The reason we normally want a no argument constructor is we may not initialize all the fields. We may initialize them lazily. We may initialize them partially. With records, remember, records are immutable. So as a result, it doesn't make sense to create a record without any of the data because you don't have the luxury of coming and changing them later. Uh, but uh, this is where things are going to evolve a little bit. There's a concept called withers that's being developed right now. And the idea of withers is that you can take a record, but you can say dot width, and you can provide a component and a value. And the width data, a component and a value. So you can incrementally build a record, kind of like using the builder pattern we are all very familiar with. So in that mm -hmm. case, what you may do is you may start with the record and then using the withers, you incrementally keep building it. It is still immutable. You're not modifying a record at the time, but you are simply mm -hmm. creating a new record instances. So, so the answer to the question, uh, the question is, uh, in one part, the libraries will have to evolve. In the other part, we will make use of the withers, and those concepts will come together nicely to make that more cohesive as we move forward. And it will not only feel more natural in the, in the, in the later stages, uh, but it also be uh, much more pleasant, in my opinion, uh, a more, more clear cut rather than uh, the way we have been doing things uh, is that you, you start with some default values and then you build up on that, you can do that. But, but also keep in mind, uh, you can write a no argument constructor yourself, that will become a non-canonical constructor. Nobody says you cannot write one, keep that in mind, right? So that's not the default. So for example, if I were to go back to this example, make sure the code is still working, it is, but what if I were to say, public location right there. Here's my no arg constructor. And I say return new location, just as an example, let's say 11.21 comma, uh, you know, and some value. you got to start with a default. That becomes necessary for you to do. So let's say, uh, is, is uh, so, oh, constructor is not canonical. So the first statement, you got to, sorry, you got to pass this to, um, uh, to a, a, you know, canonical constructor. That's the requirement, obviously, here. So this, and you can, you know, route that through the canonical constructor, so you can still do that. But, but this itself is meaningless, right? Because you cannot change a record once you create it. That's where the wither comes in. So you can start with the no argument constructor, use some silly defaults that you can start with, combine that with withers, and then you you kind of grow your object to what you want it to be using the builder pattern. So you can still do that. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And as you mentioned, the libraries must evolve. A lot of libraries have already, we have Jackson, we have uh, 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 a lot of others who have evolved. And by mentioning with this, you've already answered the next couple of questions that I had. So I'll let you move forward with your session. <laughs> 
Thank you. All right. We we got three minutes. So I want to cover something really quickly in those three minutes. And, and just to give an example of this, I'm going to say over here, let's say I'm going to create a simulate, let's say, price. And in this particular example, I'm going to take, let's say, a, a ticker uh, right in here, let's say. And I'm going to say a string, let's say, uh, a ticker, let's say, a string ticker. And in this case, I'm going to simply return a math dot, let's say, a round. Uh, let's go ahead and say uh, over here, uh, let's say a math dot random all uh, times a thousand, let's say. So, so a little value, I'm going to return a rounded value in here, but I'm going to start with uh, maybe a tickers is equal to list of, let's just say Goog and uh, AMZN. So let's just start with the two of them, right? So if I were to use these uh, two in here, and I want to say fetch, uh, let's say prices and pass tickers into it. But the problem is we want to make sure the output is meaningful as well. So here's my fetch, which takes a list of string, let's say uh, tickers. And if I were to do something like this in here, so if I were to say, uh, uh, let's say tickers dot stream uh, dot map, and given a ticker, I want to say, uh, you know, uh, a simulate price and send that ticker to it. And then I would say dot for each, and I want to print it, system dot out, and I want to print it. The problem with this approach is that when you look at the output of the code, it's pretty meaningless. Well, wouldn't it be nice to say something useful here? So Java did not doesn't have tuples, but records double as double as tuples. So that is one of the nice things about records. So I can say record stock, and I can say string, let's say ticker, and I can say a double uh, price, and guess what? I can quickly write a public string, a two string, and this simply says return string dot format. Let's go ahead and say in here, this is gonna be the ticker, and this is gonna be the price that I'm gonna bring in as well right there. So one last thing, we will simply say ticker and we'll say percent %s, and let's go ahead and say price and we'll say dollar percent uh, %g. So right there, we created a little record within our function. These are called local records and they work as a tuple. So the last thing I'll do here is to say new stock and pass the ticker and the simulated price to it. And when you run the code, you readily get a more decent, meaningful output, as you can see here. So essentially, records are really uh, tuples as well. And this can make the code really expressive and very easy to work with as well. And that becomes really a nice way, for example, to uh, use the records as a tuple. So if you're like me and you complain, oh, Java doesn't have tuples, the answer is yes, they do but they're called records now, and you can make use of them as well. Uh, as a, as a, a wrap-up, if you are interested in downloading the code examples you saw here, uh, please do so. That's the top link you should see under the downloads page. I just uploaded these code uh, right before this talk. You should be able to see that in that location. And uh, that's all I have. And thank you so much for everyone for joining. Thank you to the wonderful folks at uh, JetBrains uh, to host this and to have me on the program as well. Mala, you've been such a great host. Thank you so much again for all, all things you do. Thank you so much, Venka. That was an amazing session, a detailed part about the constructors. I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, we have tons of questions in the chat, but I'm so sorry. I will not be able to ask them to you because we uh, have to kind of start with the next session. I'm very sorry about that. but. Again, thank you so much. It, it was an amazing session. Always a pleasure to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you so much.